Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, uh, depending on where you are, and welcome to the Center for Global Development. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me, and I'm very excited about this conversation we're about to have to talk about uh, a book that has been put together by Kostas Mikolopoulos, uh, and I'll turn to him in a minute, and uh, to also welcome a number of discussants who are going to offer their perspective, and I'll introduce them as well. Uh, let me just start off by uh, showing you the book itself, which has just come out, and it's called Eight trade and development and and i just want to say that this is a real tour de force uh, that looks uh, back at uh, aid and uh, development more broadly and uh, trade uh, and other factors uh, policy coherence uh, it's also been uh, uh, an opportunity for costas uh, who produced the first edition of this book uh, five years ago uh, to now produce a second edition, which uh, looks at uh, what's been happening in the last few years and how that uh, makes us all rethink uh, what we see as the way forward to keep improving uh, the lives uh, and prospects for people living in developing countries. Uh, Costas uh, has a, a very long and distinguished history in, in terms of uh, looking at uh, international development uh, uh, issues, both from within multilateral institutions where he worked uh, in the World Bank and WTO, uh, but also uh, since he retired, looking at it and writing about uh, these uh, concepts. Now, I want to uh, then, first of all, start, as I said, by uh, asking Costas to say a little bit about uh, uh, the book, uh, what motivated him to write it, uh, what got him to uh, then come up with the second edition, and then how he sees the issues uh, 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 the state of play, if you like, on international development, international development cooperation, and the way forward. And then we have uh, three discussants uh, who are ideally placed to give us a perspective on these issues. And uh, I'm going to start by first turning to uh, uh, Claire Short uh, as the first discussant. Uh, Claire uh, was the Minister for Development in the UK at the at the time of the millennium and when DFID, the UK Development Ministry was uh, created and set up, she was the inaugural uh, minister for that and, and a real force for uh, challenging uh, the way in which the international system had been working and then trying to make sure that it lived up to its promise. Uh, and uh, she was one of a group of uh, uh, what, what was called at the turn of the millennium, the, the Utstein Group. There are four very forceful development ministers, uh, uh, four women uh, ministers who made a huge impact in terms of moving forward. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that as well. And after Claire, I'm going to turn to Jude Moore. Jude Moore is a senior policy fellow here at the Center for Global Development. Uh, and uh, previously he was the Minister of Public Works uh, in Liberia. And uh, it would be very important uh, to get a perspective from Jude of how he sees both the current situation and the challenges that uh, uh, impact uh, developing country policymakers, but also the past uh, from where this uh, current situation has evolved and, and the way forward. And finally, I'm going to turn to uh, Nancy Birdsall. Nancy Birdsall, of course, is the founding president of the Center for Global Development. But Nancy has also been a, a very insightful uh, commentator and observer of uh, what has been happening in the development cooperation. And, and of course, she was herself uh, before she came to CGD, uh, uh, an important player in the international development cooperation uh, system as a senior uh, policymaker manager inside uh, both the World Bank and then in the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank. So that's, that's the lineup. We are going to make sure we also have time for 
questions from you, the audience, and I encourage you to send in your questions uh, uh, now, and we will try to accommodate as many of them as we can. And uh, let me therefore, with no uh, further delay, move to introducing Costas and asking him to give us 10 minutes of, of his perspective on uh, the book and, and what motivates it and the main takeaways you have from it. So Costas, welcome. Uh, great to have you here and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Masood. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you for organizing this meeting uh, for on this uh, the second edition of my book on eight page in development. Uh, the meeting comes at a time when the developing world uh, is facing the prospect of another lost decade, uh, just like the one that uh, we had in the late 70s and late 80s, early 80s. Uh, I want to say a few words about the book, uh, and then I want to discuss uh, what needs to be done to prevent the, another repetition of this stagflation uh, and low growth uh, that we had uh, several years, uh, several decades ago. Now, I was very lucky to have been in a number of uh, positions uh, during my career, which brought me into contact with all the major events that characterized the last uh, 30 years uh, of the previous century. And uh, I played a small part in a lot of these uh, activities and uh, developments, and the first half of the book is about that stuff. Uh, it talks about the early days uh, of the new directions uh, of AIB following the Vietnam War, the debt uh, problems of developing countries uh, in the late uh, 70s, uh, then I moved to the bank, we tried to do structural adjustment uh, with a human uh, Face, uh, if we could. Uh, then after that, uh, the WTO, Punta del Este, the birth of the WTO, and finally, the uh, whole uh, decade of the 90s, where I spent a lot of time uh, in the uh, efforts of the World Bank uh, to help the countries uh, in the transition. Uh, and I remember the day in uh, January uh, 1992 that I descended in Kiev as the head of the First World Bank uh, uh, mission to, to, uh, to uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, at the turn of the century and the first decade of the 21st century, uh, we um, witness an unparalleled international cooperation for development, uh, for which I think uh, we need to, to give many thanks uh, to Claire and, and her a group of colleagues at the Woodstein Group. Uh, they uh, played a major role in shaping the Monterey Consensus that provided uh, coherent uh, commitments, including commitments of on coherence between aid and trade policies for development. This was unique and unprecedented. And uh, later on, the Paris Agreement uh, on Aid Effectiveness and a number of other agreements uh, to promote uh, development in the first part of the of this century. Uh, sadly, all of this started to unravel following the 2018 financial crisis. Uh, first, there was backtracking on the aid effectiveness commitments. Uh, then uh, this was followed with a decline in the quality of order and also in the quantity of uh, what we call programmable aid, uh, that is aid that uh, the countries, uh, recipient countries uh, can command at their own uh, decisions. Uh, and then uh, came Trump and the disastrous increase in protectionism, uh, deglobalization and the growth of populism, authoritarianism and uh, xenophobia. And this is where the new part of the, of the book starts, uh, around uh, 2016, 2017. Uh, as if the Trump uh, pandemic was not enough, a real pandemic uh, hit uh, in late 2019, and the world is not the same since then. Uh, 
Uh, the last several chapters in the book address the challenges we face in ending global poverty, addressing climate change, and achieving sustainable development. Uh, the global community was not making much progress in achieving the sustainable development goals uh, uh, in uh, the aftermath of the agreement in 2015. Um, and uh, when the pandemic uh, struck, they wreaked havoc on prospects for developing countries, especially in the area of health, education, and poverty in general. Now, we were um, starting to recover, recover unevenly, but recover nevertheless, uh, when uh, Putin invaded Ukraine and things got worse. Uh, the book was at the printers when the war started, so it does not cover the effects of the invasion in detail. Uh, but we can discuss, uh, for example, the massive prospective famine resulting from the blockade of Odessa uh, and rising energy and food prices globally. Uh, let me conclude by focusing a summary on what needs to be done. Um, what needs to be done in the first instance is for the war in Ukraine to stop. More longer term, the most important thing is, of course, to address climate change. But then I, uh, I think that we should think about making globalization, which is going to continue, making globalization more equitable. And this, I think, requires five components, or has five components. One is to strengthen the safety nets. Uh, secondly, is to address the refugee crisis. Uh, we need to deal with the increasing power of the multinational corporations. We need to fix the WTO, which is in a big mess right now and really totally ineffective. And hopefully, they will do something next week when they have this new meeting, but I'm not really hoping very much that this will conclude anything significant. And finally, we need to strengthen the WHO in order to prevent, uh, to the extent possible, additional epidemics. I'll stop at this point and uh, I look forward to hear uh, the discussions and uh, have a lively chat afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kostas, for that introduction. And I'm going to turn to uh, now to Claire, if I may. And uh, Claire, it, it'd be great to get a little bit uh, your take on sort of not just the way Kostas has laid out where we are but also where we are coming from and i remember you and you said something the other day when we spoke which stayed with me that that you said that after the fall of the the berlin wall in a way international development and i'm reducing poverty around the world became the global project and and in a way since and, and cost us uh, i think a lot of people would use the 2008 2009 uh, cr financial crisis as a as a benchmark there, but since then, progressively, that project seems to be uh, no longer as compelling, no longer uh, having the same degree of of political and and I would say popular support that was uh, there beforehand. And and you're uniquely placed to give us your perspective on this. So can I turn to you now, please? Yes, thank you. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I think this is a really valuable book. It's hard to find in one place the story of development, its successes and failures, that anyone who, especially in this period when everything's so disappointing, but when we've got to go forward again, people can get access to all the knowledge of what worked, what didn't work, what went well. So I recommend the book. It's also extremely readable. Yes, I think it is interesting. Why after the fall of the Soviet Union, did development become the sort of dominant issue in the international system? I think it was because, I mean, after all the spying and all the rest, they didn't know that the Soviet Union was going to crumble. It suddenly happened. There was no need for high defense spending cuts. So what was the big theme? And coming up to the new millennium, we, a lot of us worked for it, but it became development. Let's let's have a sustainable future for the world, a more just future, 
let's focus on development, the Millennium Development Goals. It became the strongest story in the international system. And we made a lot of progress in working together, in being more respectful of developing countries, in having real partnerships, and then taking the lead in building their institutions. And I think a lot was achieved, well, just in pure numbers. I mean, the number of people in poverty in the world reduced considerably, and lots more children went to school, etc. Now we've lived through a period of, of everyone turning away, not being interested, the quality has declined. Of course, in Britain, they've destroyed the ministry uh, that was an effective contributor to the cause. They've cut the budgets. They've recently cut the amount of money that goes through the World Bank to do more bilaterally, but we know that the multilateral institutions do a better job. So Britain's gone backwards very big, and, and I think most countries are going backwards. So it's a time for us to regird, to read Costas's book, to think what did we do well, what needs to change because of those new challenges, and I do think new opportunities will arise. The, the seriousness of the threat of climate change to all of us means that we have to get much more serious about creating a sustainable future for all of us. And there will be an appeal then, a need for the knowledge. How do we do this? Let's build on. So that's our job in this time to reflect on how we go forward, what worked in the past, and Costas book can help us to do that. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. And uh, as you say, that there was a time when Every element of uh, government policy, whether people working on defense or on trade, they were trying to align their objectives with the development project, because that seemed to be what really gave it validation. And, and that's in some ways what uh, got away. And, and we'll dwell a little further into why that's happened. Now, Judy, could I turn to you? So, so there's this perspective that you're, that you're hearing and that's in the book. Um, I think you were very much at the receiving end at the, the partner, if you like, that a lot of people are engaging in. Liberia at that time coming through, a lot of international uh, interest in supporting the, the government in Liberia th that you were part of. Um, and now, of course, the situation very different. In particular, what we haven't mentioned so far is that there are new players in the international development scene, notably, but not only China, uh, which has become a huge source of development, uh, finance and development partnership more generally, and, and is brought with it both strengths and, and, and challenges. So I want to get a little bit your take on, on the book, but more broadly on the the situation it uh, it lays out and describes. Thank you, Masood. Uh, uh, I think I will start first um, with the same observations that uh, Claire made. It is an excellent book because it is um, it, it captures international development as we know it, as it's been practiced up to this point. And so as we look forward, because that's one of the things we're thinking about is how do we go forward? We see where we've made mistakes before. We see the improvements that we've made. And, and so my, my take reading the book is just how much, I don't know how much Costa will, Costas will agree with this, but how much the more things change because there's been significant change, uh, the more they stay the same, right? So in terms of themes, in terms of actors, what do I mean by this? Very early on in the book, he talks about how developing countries at the time were protesting the terms of trade. Why? Because predominantly their, their exports tend to, tend to specialize in, in raw materials and primary commodity exports and then for imports depended on capital goods and finished goods. Well, for a good part of sub-Saharan Africa, that, that dynamic remains uh, in 2020. Uh, close to 70% of sub-Saharan African exports to the EU 27 was primary, um, primary materials, um, raw materials. And so on the continent, this question remains. And this is a question that comes from the, the very foundation of the development system as we know it. So that's one of the things, one of the reasons why I said. But some of the questions that he discusses in the book, for example, aid effectiveness, who benefits? That is still a question that we're trying to solve today, especially I, I just did an event with um, Chinese lending. And that is a big question about Chinese lending, who benefits from it. But this is not a new question. This is a question that's come up before. And you see that you see that in the book. Then there's the issue of, uh, of debt. 
and, and the Paris Club. Well, what we have today is basically the decline of the, private, the, the, the Paris Club as a dominant player in the bilateral lending space. And we have the rise of China as the largest creditor. Uh, and we were just talking yesterday about you know, how hopeful it looks that China would chair a creditor committee, but it appears like the Chinese themselves. So all of these things that were supposedly resolved in, in, in over the course of, of development, we're seeing them coming back, maybe through different actors. And, 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 and so the final thing that I would say is that from my perspective, as uh, you know, the recipient of aid and, and people who were the partners, was one of the changes, and it's a good thing that we've seen in, in the practice of development, is the increase in the diversity of voices and, and diversity of ideas of how development is supposed to be practiced. Now, if you read Costas' book, one of the things you'll find is how iterative the process has been. Some of the things worked, some of them didn't. We learn from what worked, we learn from what didn't. But at the time of the application, they were not presented as, you know, like the Chinese thing of feeling the stones while we're crossing the river. They were presented a fait complete. This is the dominant uh, thinking on development and how it works. And, and, and so I think going forward, as we face things like climate change and other global public goods issue, is to do it with a little bit more humility uh, in, in, in terms of how we, how we, how we approach that. And, and the final thing I would say is that the rise of China is a significant uh, event in the history of international development. So recently we've seen that the EU now has global gateway and the US is talking about B3W. Well, those two projects are a response to Chinese financing of infrastructure. And again, if you look in Costas' book, at the beginning he talks, development recognized that we needed to build physical capital, this infrastructure. But over time, we've moved away from that. And when the Chinese became the dominant player in finance and infrastructure, the international development system itself had to recalculate and, and be able to respond to that. So again, generally, excellent book in terms of the history of this, but I couldn't help but notice how much things have changed and how much things have remained the same. I, I... Thank you very much, Judith. That, that's really interesting. Uh, now, I'm going to turn to Nancy uh, next, please. So, Nancy, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Masood, and thank you, Costas. Let me repeat how much I enjoyed reading this book. I particularly found what you talk, the trade portion, where I think most development people, including myself, are undertrained in the relevance of the WTO and in general, the relevance of trade relations. So that connection that you make, well, in the other book, in your first book, but again, here on your WTO agenda is really important. I hope we can get the book, we can get Ngozi Okonjo Iweala to read the book or have a talk with you. Um, so where are we now? I wrote down a couple of things. First, I think we really do have in the world globalization fatigue. It's related in part to the rise of China, but it's mostly related to the sense that neoliberalism and what is called unfairly the Washington consensus worked out badly for the poor and for those who, let's say, the non-elite in general. And with that globalization fatigue has come shrunken expectations about what we can achieve. So way, one way I think of it, uh, maybe because I'm an American citizen, is we, we really miss the hegemonic role of the US uh, until, up, up through really maybe, as Costas suggests indirectly, the global financial crisis where the U.S. could make a difference because it made mistakes, we made mistakes, but it had the power to push good things as well. So we really have a challenge because now we have to deal with what Costa says, and this is, I think, important, a new global social contract where we make what Costa calls re-globalization much more fair than in the first round. And 
I'm struck with the pandemic about how we do not have anything like a global social contract. We don't have anything close to what you might call automatic stabilizers in terms of cash transfers cross borders when things go badly in the poorer parts of the world. So, and it's the same as uh, Jude was saying about debt. We don't really have yet, we're struggling to get to a meaningful approach on debt. We don't have the, the corollary to what HIPIC was for the low income countries, for the low, the middle income, lower middle income countries especially. We've struggled as an international community with that, but it's just not going that well, frankly, in the absence of some sort of big push, probably from with leadership from the two big multilateral institutions at the global level, the World Bank and the IMF. Um, now, the f another point I wanted to make about where we are now in the last one is I see a healthy new assertiveness coming from developing countries. Mm -hmm. And Trude just referred to it in a way, I think it's particularly strong in Africa, where it's huge. It's been a huge accomplishment to have a trade agreement that covers the continent or the sub-Saharan African, I guess the whole continent. And you know, it's framed in the uh, larger community of NGOs and civil society in a healthy way as a sort of constructive decolonization. And that is something very positive for re-globalization, as Costas puts it, with much more emphasis on a global social contract to deal with the shared global problems that we all know now that COVID and climate have demonstrated very nicely. That has to be the big agenda including through some of the issues that Costas raises on trade arrangements. But let's go back to that in the next round before Thank getting into details. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Masood. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. So Costas, could I come back to you at this point? I think just A, to react a little bit to what you heard. But the other thing I was hoping you might do to help set the stage for the remainder of our conversation is talk a little bit more about how we make progress. I think you very nicely laid out, here are the things that need to be done. You know, we need to have a WTO reform that functions. We need to have better safety nets. We need to find a global health security mechanism that works. We need to have some resolution on debt. As Nancy was being polite, I think, I think that the current, the current mechanisms for dealing with debt are completely broken down right now. They're just not functioning at all. So. I think everybody has, I mean, in, in some ways, it's also interesting for me to watch that the heads of the big institutions have started becoming commentators and, and sort of saying there are all these problems that need to be fixed. And so everyone is pointing to the problem. And I wanted really to see if you could spend a few minutes talking a little also about how do we make progress? Where is the momentum going to come from? The U.S., uh, as Nancy said, uh, in some sense, hegemonic, you could say, was well, indispensable still, even if it's not hegemonic, and and hasn't been all that engaged in terms of moving forward uh, with proposals on on reform of the system. Beginning to maybe see some change on climate now, but uh, the U.S.-China relationship has been a big issue in terms of finding common ground for for moving forward on, on even issues where both would benefit from some kind of uh, common approach. Maybe it's the middle powers, as, as, as maybe it's the developing countries. Uh, Africa, I think, during the pandemic demonstrated a degree of initiative and, and leadership that really the rest of the world wasn't able to, to uh, bring together. So I just wanted to get a bit your take on that set of issues as well and then get reactions from others and i know that claire you have to leave early so after costas i'm going to come back to you uh costas uh thank you very much i, I agreed with a lot of the things that were said uh, I, particularly I, I want to emphasize the importance of the developing countries playing a more active role uh in the international scene this is critical this has changed and it is 
it should be very welcome. Uh, things have changed, things are basically the same. Yes, the new Chinese uh, involvement is to be welcomed, and of course the Chinese are doing exactly what the OECD used to do 30 years ago or 40 years ago. They have tied all their assistance to China. Uh, this is one of the things that the OECD has started to get away from, and it's time that the, the Chinese start thinking about that themselves rather than using aid as a vehicle for promoting Chinese exports. Uh, let me go back to Asud's, Masood's uh, request of how to do it, how to promote, uh, how to promote international change. Uh, I think the pandemic and all the discussions on climate change suggest that you need to have to do it multilaterally. Uh, there are no options uh, here. You have to do multilateral. Uh, you have to have multilateral action uh, to deal with uh, both pandemic uh, and uh, and the long term issue of climate change. How do you promote multilateral action when the politics are fractured? That is the issue for the day. Uh, and here, I think that it is not simply uh, U.S. versus China. Uh, China is very important in debt and finance and trade. Uh, but the, what you have here is a, a very much a, a situation like the 1930s, when you have a lot of international actors, each pursuing uh, their own individual interests, uh, Trained from China to Russia to Brazil to India, so that becomes a much more challenging uh, of, of, of situation uh, to, to create a coherent uh, international response to the problems that exist in development. Um, we need strong public commitment. This has been present in some countries on climate change, but it needs to be extended to other issues, to other public goods issues, including poverty reduction. I would say that, um, you know, the institutions such as uh, the CGD have an important role to play in promoting discussion and about these issues. And uh, these institutions were very important uh, during the time uh, at the turn of the century in, in, in having uh, uh, action done on, on debt, for example. Uh, I remember this was a very important uh, component of the uh, of uh, the background to the, creating the HIPIC. Uh, this kind of action is needed now, not only on climate change, but on other issues as well. Um, let me let me have one final comment uh, to make about the geopolitics. Um, I think on trade and finance issues, Russia is not very relevant. China is most important, uh, especially on debt and, uh, and finance and trade. Uh, we need in the short term its collaboration to fix both the debt and the WTO. Uh, Russia is irrelevant on both. Russia is important on energy and maybe on climate change. Uh, and one final word on this, uh, how to do it. Uh, we may not be able to do truly global action uh, if you have fractured geopolitics. So we may need to work on what we call in the WTO plurilateral agreements. Plurilateral agreements, which is agreements among the among countries that uh, think the same way. And in this, it's important to bring in the developing countries, not only the developing of countries in participating in agreements in WTO of common interest. And another agreement similar to that, such as the one that was done originally in the OECD about uh, uh, putting a floor on, M on the taxations of multilaterals, which is now extended from, uh, the, the, from the OECD to other countries as well. Such agreements, I think, are going to be the vehicle for moving forward. Thank you very much, Costas, and, and thank you for reminding us of the international tax agreement, because I do think that's a very good illustration, even in a difficult period, for countries to be able to come together and, and find common ground. Claire, could I turn to you? What's your take and advice on, on how one can move forward? What... The first thing I want to say is that China is a development success. I mean, everyone talks of China now, it's a great power. 
in my time in government, we had programs in the poorer parts of China. The World Bank was working with China. I mean, I just want us to remember that development can succeed and when it takes off. I mean, look at the transformation and the massive numbers of people who were desperately poor in China who aren't anymore. So success is possible. Um, the other thing I do want to say, because I think this is what will drive the future, the, the next period is going to be very tough in both the OECD countries and in developing countries. We're going to see more poverty and so on. But the reason for the turn against the international system and globalization is the, the version that we had has created great inequality and poverty everywhere. And the sort of mood in the in countries like my own because there were so many people who are having a really tough time. We've got hungry children who have to go to charities to get enough, you know, in, in this Britain, the in, in millions of children. Um, and that makes for an atmosphere of ungenerous looking at the world, of kind of selfish angriness. And I think that's going to be more so in all countries because the, the, the suffering is going to be worse everywhere. So there'll be a mood of anger and uprising and troubles um, that will potentially make the world think we better we better react this is getting dangerous like remember the Arab Spring for example when you get big movements like this the world thinks heavens we can't control things you know what could we do and that creates an opportunity for a new push on a more sustainable world order and a better chance for the poorer people of the OECD countries and the and the rest of the world. So I think that's where we're going. I think it's going to get nasty and a lot of nasty politics, but also, you know, big refugee flows, worse climate change, um, all sorts of forces that will say, heavens, we'd better stabilize the world. This is dangerous for all of us. And that means we have to listen to the poor and the angry in all our countries. So our job in the meantime, I mean, those are sort of objective political conditions that are coming, is to get the ideas ready. So as the world turns to say, what the heck are we going to do? This is chaotic and dangerous and angry. We've updated our views on development. We have an agenda that we know how to roll forward. And I think that's where we are. And that's our job. I mean, both to speak up for the need to do it, but also I do appeal, speak in a language that talks to the poor of Britain as well as the poor of Africa. They have a joint interest in us doing this better. And they're all hurting and it's going to get worse. Thank you very much, Claire, for for that. And I think you're you're absolutely right, both in terms of you know ability to recognize and and respect the fact that people have been left behind and they're angry about it, and and not to see that as something they should just get over. I mean, it it is a real reality for people, and and we need to. Appreciate that, and also I would say that, in some ways, to be open to defining that the priorities for development going forward are not about recreating the past model for development. Yeah, that you know the the issues are different, the challenges are going to be different, and I and I do sometimes think that there is a job to be done there, even within the development community, for us to. Uh, think about these new issues in ways that are more open, uh, with a more open mind, but also to bring the expertise that we have gathered over 50 years of development, cooperation and partnership to tackling some of these new issues where the same problems will arise if we don't learn from the, the experience that we've had in, in, in doing the traditional development cooperation for so long. So I, I think that's a very important point. Um, Judy, can I ask for your take on how you think we can move forward? Sure. And can I apologize again that I have to leave? And please, everyone who's out there, read this book, and then let's have the debate about how we take everything forward and learn what was right and what failed right. and how we can do better together. Well, th thank, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. All the best, everybody. Thank you. Judy. I, I think I want to go back to Nancy's point, um, the point that Nancy started off when she responded to the book about globalization fatigue. And part of that, I think, generally is because there is a feeling, and there's evidence to back it, 
that the spoils of globalization were unevenly distributed, right? That they, they accrued to one group of, a small group of people in significant quantities while others lost advantages. Jobs, I mean, the jobs that were lost from say here in the United States and across the developed world that went to parts of China, now Vietnam, um, Capital won and labor lost, right? And so once ca labor, capital was free to move around the world and labor could be pitted against each other in a race to the bottom, we get this. And my fear as we look toward the future is that is some of what Claire was saying, Africa now comprises one fifth of the world's population. By mid-century, it will be one fourth. And at 25% of the world's population, if we're incapable at the moment to accommodate the numbers as they are, what does it look like then? So I think as we look toward the future, one, what can be done? First is that Africa has to be brought in as a partner that's taken seriously as we think of global um, um, problems. So Africa, the, the entire continent, India is one fifth of the global population, China is. Th this idea that big global problems can be solved without meaningful impact in Africa, meaningful contribution from the Africans. It's not possible. I, I, you, know, you, you have to take that into account. The second thing is we have to figure out a way, I think Nancy alluded to this, that in the past, when we had a dominant global hegemon, it would take the lead on big problems. Now, as we're moving into a multipolar world, how does that happen, right? Who takes the lead in doing that? Especially if the dominant powers have different visions of what the international system is supposed to look like. So I, I, I think one is a, a greater voice for people who have not had that much of a say, whether it's Africa, whether it's Latin America, whether it's South Asia, in this might help to balance um, how we think about how we do this going forward. And, and finally, I think, you know, the, the response will have to match the scale of the problem we're trying to solve. I mean, right now, there is a lot of resentment in parts of Africa and parts of Asia. First, in the response to the pandemic, how overwhelmingly that response was in developed countries and how underwhelming it was in, in the developing world. And, and, and now we're seeing with Ukraine, definitely the Ukrainians should get as much support as is possible for them. But the scale of the support to Ukraine and the response to similar situations elsewhere creates this idea that we're not all in this together. And so if there is a possibility for us to solve these problems and avoid the problems of the past that cost us, you know, outline, outlines in his book, it, it is about this. It's about this sense of fairness in, in, in solving these problems. So that would be my, my, my comment on that. Thank you very much, Judy. And thank you for raising this issue of fairness and double standards. Because I would say that there, there is one the manifestation of what you might call long COVID at a global level. It is the erosion of trust and a breakdown of faith in the what people used to call the international community. And I've had friends who are policymakers in Africa say to me, I don't really believe in the international community anymore. And, and that's a serious uh, issue because if, if you don't have that faith and trust, that, and it comes from double standards, but it also comes, I would say, from making a lot of promises with no clear follow-up. To deliver on them and and I, I almost wonder whether people should tone down the rhetoric of what will be delivered if uh, if they have no uh plan to follow through and deliver on it uh nancy could i get your take on this as well then we'll come back to costas for any final thoughts okay uh many smart things have been said <laughs> let me start with that um what jude just said made me think, you know, the African Union should be recognized as part of the G20, at least. Uh, is the EU in the G20? I don't, I don't know these details. If the EU is in the G20, why isn't the African Union in the G20? So I hope Jude will lead a movement to push for the African Union. I mean, the psychology around that 
could be important. Second, you know, I do think we need a movement for reforms at the multilateral institutions, as Masood knows well. I've been talking about that for maybe too long. But, you know, a reforms that would give developing countries more power, more votes, and more responsibility. Um, and somehow China has to be mixed in there. So, you know, I mean, I asked myself, what would the IMF look like? Would it be so terrible if the U.S. didn't have an effective veto on uh, new issues of special drawing rights and on other major changes in the IMF? Would it be so terrible if at least there was contestation among Americans for pres the presidency of the World Bank? instead of just White House says, and then everybody kind of works it out. So small things like that, that send signals about the reality that this is a bigger world in which it's not just the G7 anymore. That was such a big signal of the creation of the G20 in 2008. Something comparable to that, that recognizes the new challenges. So maybe CGD could somehow take on something like that. I do think that Costas is right in laying out a development agenda for the WTO. You know, that also would be a big signal because it's the WTO that became, became the sort of uh, whipping, what do you say, bag, starting at Seattle, the protests in, for everything that then came to be called neoliberalism, Washington consensus, unfairness, all this view that uh, globalization has been a big a disaster on the uh, fairness. And it hasn't been, you know, it's such a mixed bag and Costas' book does a very good job of recognizing that if it were only so simple. And then, you know, I would say we need another something, an analog to the Jubilee movement or where, where is Oxfam now? Why, you know, is there some way CGD could be creating alliances with some of the civil society organizations to do things like let's have an agenda for fairness at the WTO, you know, for change on the, this climate issue, the border adjustment. I mean, these are an interesting combination right. of details that matter where Costas is so good and CGD has the capability as do other think tanks. And at the same time, there has to be the big push. And I, I of course, I like the word fair for sure. Um, and I think, you know, a little bit more emphasis when we talk about multilateralism on something of what Claire was reflecting. If you're in the UK, be pushing on the UK's failing agenda on development compared to what it was 20, 30 years ago. If you're in the US, be pushing for the changes in US policy that will matter for the developing world, which of course is CGD's traditional role. So it's complicated, it's hard, but it is time. It is time for a, a, a new spirit of pushing forward on development. And for that, we should thank Costas in a yeah. way. <laughs> like, thank you very much, Nancy. That's, yeah, I'm, the way you've laid out, you know, that how you can actually try and build consensus, but also to do the analysis that underpins that the consensus. So you know, to do, advocacy, you need also to have the ideas and articulate them into practical proposals. And in some ways, that's what CGD started doing under your leadership. And, and that's what CGD still does. So I think that's uh, certainly a big plus. The G20, as you said, was really a big, in some ways, positive change from thinking about the G7. It was a reflection of the fact that people in the G7 recognized that they could not have make decisions that would have global impact uh, 
without bringing in other major players. Today, people are saying that the G20 is becoming less and less functional because of the disagreements amongst the key uh, participants in the, uh, within the G20. So it will be interesting to see how the G20 evolves going forward. And, and uh, so I, I do think that finding ways to stay engaged with all the key players, but in whatever format, is going to be essential to make progress on some of these issues where you can't make progress without having them on board. So, uh, Costas, can I turn back to you for any final thoughts before we close out? Uh, a couple of final thoughts. Thank you. Uh, multilateralism has to improve by getting Africa more involved in all its uh, dimensions including G20, which has to be somehow put together. Uh, but Africa has not been unified, but that has been a problem. The more unified Africa is, the more uh, involvement it will have in the global scene. Um, I uh, think in particular in the IMF, for example, the Africa voice has to improve, has to increase. Uh, that's reflected, for example, in the allocation of the SDRs. Uh, which is uh, finally now we got the situation where uh, now somebody said, well, maybe the, the, the developing countries in the, in the IMF should be getting a little bit better than the, the quotas in terms of the SDR. Uh, I want to finish by making one uh, uh, comment, which is here a quote from uh, the last sentence in my book. Uh, and this reflects the issue of... Uh, uh, the fairness, uh, social justice in the global sense, uh, which is the most important thing, I think, for the globalization uh, process. It's going to go forward. Globalization has to go forward. Otherwise, we're going to go backwards very seriously in terms of all aspects of, of human uh, behavior. Uh, but uh, the last sentence that I wanted to quote was that... Uh, the developing, the, the OECD countries have uh, shown some uh, important coalescence in trying to help Ukraine, which I suspect is going to mean less money for the, for Africa in the future. But I think, and this is the last sentence, democracies need to also sacrifice for the good of the global commons, including to act to promote global social and environmental justice. And I hope that uh, CGD continues to be involved in all these issues because it can, it can make a contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Costas. I, I want to also end by quoting a sentence from your uh, book, which, uh, you know, things look difficult and sometimes you, you worry about prospects, but it is important. And, and, I, and you have in your book this quote from Daniel Kahneman, uh, which says, when action is needed, optimism, even of the mildly delusional variety, may be a good thing. And I don't know whether it's delusional or not, but I do believe that uh, I think we do need to keep focused on the possibility of how to make the world better and, and where there are opportunities to, to find ways to make progress even at times when uh, progress looks difficult. So I want to come back to what Claire was saying as well uh, before she left to say that this is the moment for us to be thinking about how to prepare uh, an agenda for action, that even if it doesn't get acted on right away in all its uh, elements, uh, gives us the basis for moving forward uh, as the situation politically and socially uh, it improves and allows us to, to do that. So with that, let me thank uh, Costa, thank you for, for taking the time to share the, your thoughts and, and to bring this book uh, to us. Uh, I want to thank uh, Judy and Nancy both uh, on screen. I want to also thank Claire for having taken the time to, to join us. And I want to thank all of you who have participated in this. Uh, and uh, have had a chance to listen in. If you do have any questions or comments subsequently, do send them along and we will pass them along to the panelists uh, and respond to you as appropriate. Thank you.